Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Neosystems CMMC Town Hall. Now I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neosystems. Ed? Thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited today to welcome uh, Eric Crucius of Holland at Night. I want to welcome you as well to our uh, continuing series of Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions on the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Um, Today we have some uh, breaking news with respect to new uh, DFARS uh, interim rule has, has come out. And uh, Eric Crucius uh, from Holland and Knight, welcome uh, to, uh, to, to walk us through that. I wanna announce first to the audience that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the defense industrial base. Uh, our focus as a managed service provider is primarily on organizations seeking certification. So that's uh, who we have primarily in the audience today. If you do have uh, some questions, please submit those on the Zoom Q&A feature. And I will try to work as many of those questions in uh, as I can. I'll start with, with a quick introduction of, of Eric. Um, Eric has joined us before on this series. Uh, he's a partner at Holland and Knight, specializing in government and technology contract law. He received his JD from Hofstra in 2000 and he's been practicing law for nearly 20 years with a strong focus on representing government contractors and technology companies. So uh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us today, Eric. Sure, thanks for having me, Ed. Um, the big news uh, today is the new DFARS interim rule uh, that's relating to both CMMC and the NIST SP 800-171 assessments. Uh, so this was published in the Federal Register yesterday and takes effect on November 30th. So let's start with an overview for the audience, just unpacking this package a little bit. Um, this new rule introduces three new DFARS clauses, DFARS 252.204, 7019, 7020, and 7021. Can you give us just a high level survey of the thrust of these new clauses? Sure, so let's start with the last one and that's the CMMC DFARS clause, which is what we were, a lot of us were all waiting for. And then the first two have to do with a, a kind of a new program that we weren't really anticipating, although we heard, uh, at least I heard through some folks, some rumblings about it the week before the rule was released, but this idea that there will be uh, self and DOD led assessments of 800-171 compliance. So the, the other two clauses deal with that. One is a kind of a notice clause and one has the, more of the meat of what's, what's going to happen. So that's kind of the landscape of those three clauses that we see. So We've looked at the CMMC a lot in this series. Uh, we've been doing these pretty pretty much every week since since May or so. Um, the new DFAR 7021, it doesn't really have any big surprises with respect to CMMC, at least by my read, you may may have some surprises for me. Um, but these these 171 assessments, as you mentioned, are a little bit of a new and, and maybe unexpected by some. Um, I think there were insiders perhaps in the DOD that knew all this was, was in the works, but uh, for those of us in the industry, I think have been very focused on the CMMC aspect. So the 7019 and 7020 clauses, these are a new and separate requirement, and they require contractor self-assessments for covered information systems, and they require those to be submitted to the DOD's uh, Supplier Performance Risk System, SPRS, and they also enable DOD to conduct their own assessments when needed. So um, the rule explains that these assessments are complementary to the CMMC process. How will these assessments differ from CMMC assessments in terms of their content and purpose, do you think? And given that, you know, the 110 rules within NIST 171 are all included within CMMC at, at levels three and above, and given that the rule says there's no intent for duplication, how do you see this working in practice? So I, I, I think part of it is that this is, at least to me, obviously a stopgap measure until CMMC is fully rolled out because you know, they have confirmed that CMMC they expect it to fully roll out in five years from now. Um, and, and more and more contractors will be kind of roped into CMMC during that course of time. But, um, you know, and, and we mentioned, you mentioned this earlier and I saw it too, that DOD continues to be suspicious that contractors are compliant with 800-171, even though they're saying that they are. So if you look at how this juxtaposes with CMMC from, from a CMMC level three perspective, it's very 800-171 and the 110 security controls is very similar to level three, although level three has additional controls in it. Um, so it's going to be pretty similar to that, but you know, a contractor who might try to obtain level three may not have to do so for another three or four years. So this allows DOD to get more insight on what that contractor is, is doing. Um, and it, it, 
I think the idea of having to put this in on a website um, maybe makes it more real. Maybe DOD thinks it'll make it more real for contractors if they have to physically go go through the 110 controls and give a score about how many they are complying with. So I, I, I think part of the reason that they have this is because CMMC is going to take a little while to roll out. And this is kind of, it may work alongside by side CMMC in five years, who knows, but I think it'll be largely duplicative at that time. Um, so we'll just see. The content, I mean, as I mentioned, there's an overlap in the controls. The NIST 171 requirement is based on covered information systems. So it's done at the system level as opposed to the sort of contractor enterprise or entity entity level, which is, which is one difference. Um, yeah. And you're right. They should be able to start uploading these immediately. Essentially um, the requirement in 7019 is for a basic assessment uh, that the contractor does themselves. So if they take the self attestation that they're doing today under the DFARS and now turn that into uh, an assessment score and up and upload that, um, you know, presumably it's something that could, could start effectively immediately. Right. So there's an effective date on this of uh, November 30th. Um, so the current DFAR 7012 clause is, as I understand it, unchanged by this rule. So that means there's no change to the requirements to, for um, NIST 800-171 compliance, the security uh, requirements on cloud service providers, incident handling, subcontractor flow down, all four of those things that are currently in 7012. Um, are there any gotchas that we should be thinking about in terms of how these new clauses, the 1920 and 21, interact with the existing 7012 clause? Um, a couple things just to think about. One, I had a hard time finding in the rule um, when a medium or high assessment would be necessary. And I, I did finally find it after reading through a couple times that, um, that it's a kind of in DOD's discretion which contracts they want to choose for a medium or high assessment. Um, so it would be interesting to see what criteria they use. And if they announce the criteria they're going to use to, to decide which, which um, um, contracts are worthy of a medium or high assessment. So, and that will allow um, part of DOD to come in and do an investigation or an assessment of 800-171 compliance separate and apart from, from CMMC. I think the most interesting thing is, I mean, what we had heard earlier, I believe from DOD was that the CMMC clause would be a revised 7012 clause and that they're going to put CMMC into 7012. And that's not what happened. They just created- That's what I expected. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think we heard that, Ed, um, also. And, um, you know, now it's a separate course. So now we have four clauses that kind of deal with this issue. Um, and I think that will make it a little bit more difficult for contractors to kind of get a handle on what exactly they have to do. I mean, most clients I talk to just say, tell me what I need to do so I can do it. And the tell me what I need to do is you have to look at these four separate clauses now instead of one. Yeah. Um, and I think that can make things a little bit more complicated because I think there'll be unintentional consequences on how these things interact with each other. Um, and I think, you know, surprises in the CMMC clause, I was a little bit surprised um, that they didn't work out some of the things that we didn't know. For instance, um, the end of the clause seems to strongly insinuate that this prime contractor will determine the, um, um, the subcontractor's level requirement in a CMMC situation. So if a contract is given a level three, the prime has a bunch of subs working on it and this prime will decide what levels the subs need to have to perform the contract. And, um, you know, the process on how that's done, what criteria contractors should use, all that kind of stuff is absent from the, from the rule. What happens if the government disagrees with the prime contractors, um, assessment that somebody should only be a level one or two instead of a level three as a subcontractor. Um, you know, I think that's kind of missing and, Although we did get a little bit about it in the um, kind of the prologue to the actual rule, we didn't hear, hear a lot about what happens if a contractor disagrees with an assessment um, and how they how that works out. You know, there's an appeal process within the, the CMMC AB, but it's not entirely clear how that would play out and what rights contractors have. Because in the end, if you get a negative or you, you fail to obtain a level that you're looking for an assessment to perform a contract, that means you don't win the contract or you can't perform the contract. Right. So it's pretty serious consequences. So I was hoping for a little bit more meat on those bones, but I imagine we'll get that in some kind of uh, guidance document. But again, um, it would have been better to have it in a rule to kind of make it more enforceable. Sometimes these guidance documents, depending on how they're released, make it difficult to kind of get the government to abide by them. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, the, the language in there right now is that the contractor will determine the level for their subcontractors and make that make flow down an appropriate level. It doesn't really give any guidance into what would, how they would determine appropriateness. And it is in, implied that it's based on the information that they share with them. Uh, but again, the exact rules of, of when that would need to be a level one, level two, level three, level four or five. Yeah, yeah. And not, like not really they well say appropriate far. level. Um, I think where the vagueness is, who determines what the appropriate level is? Is that something they're going to hear from DOD? Or is that something that um, they're going to determine on their own? And I wish they were just a little bit more explicit about that. But it, to me, it seems like they, they're expecting the prime to do it. I wish they would have just said that. So I want to take a quick uh, backup. I uh, did get a question from the audience that we, we blurted out three DFARS numbers uh, so fast that maybe people didn't catch them. So I want to, I want to slow that down, rewind it a little bit. Uh, so the, the uh, current DFARS clause that we've talked about is DFARS 252.204-7012-7012. And then the new clauses that are in this interim rule are uh, DFARS 252.204, so the same prefix, and they're dash 7019, 7020, 7021. So 7019 is what requires the contractors to do the uh, assessments of NIST 800-171 compliance and submit that to the DOD. 7020, 7020 requires them to flow that down to subcontractors and it also requires them to allow the DOD to come in and do uh, higher level assessments, medium and high um, level assessments under NIST 171 if the government, if and when the government chooses to do that. And then the 7021 clause is what implements uh, CMMC. It requires that uh, certification to be uh, obtained prior to a contract award. Is that anything to add to that? No, I was actually just rereading. I mean, because this just came out a couple of days ago, so I've read it through a bunch of times. But um, and my camera's not working, so I apologize. I've had some technical difficulties, and it's really a great view you have there. If you have the same one I do, um, but I, 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 it's interesting. That the A B doesn't seem to be mentioned in the um, in the seventy twenty one clause. Yeah, I think you're right. There's discussion about them in the in the notice, right? right? And discusses a whole lot of details about how they'll operate in the appeals process and the C3PAO process, but uh, but not in the in the actual clause. Um, so, um, well, you you brought up the the question of what does this mean, right? How do people know? We don't have a lot of detail of of what they know. One of the things that they mentioned in the notice, um, which has been been true before, but I don't know that it's been pointed out quite quite, quite so crystal clear is that the current clause, the 7012 clause, uh, that requires adequate security of covered information systems, that appears in a whole lot of DOD contracts today, nominally all of them, right? right. And, and yet, if you are a contractor who doesn't actually handle any CUI, controlled unclassified information, you don't have to do anything to comply with 7012 because you don't have any co covered information systems, therefore, no requirement applies. And it says that in the notice, it, it clarifies that. So um, my understanding then of the notice is that because those companies that have the 7012 clause and now are going to have these new clauses, those same companies would still not need to do anything new under 7019 or 7020 with respect to 800-171 assessments because they don't have any covered information systems. But they would need to get CMMC level one under that new DFARS 7021 clause. Do you, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you think that's correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. And um, I definitely do. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see um, how aggressive the uh, DOD is about assigning levels to contracts. Because one thing we don't have in here at all is the criteria DOD will use when they're assigning a level to a contract. And I was, you know, I always have a great hope before a clause, whether it's from DOD or elsewhere, is released about all the details it's going to have in it. And, and then I'm always disappointed, <laughs> but um, I should I should learn by now that they try to keep as much detail out of these clauses as possible to give themselves maximum flexibility. It's the same thing I would do if I were them as well. But um, I, I I hope that they make public kind of the criteria that they're going to use to kind of assign different levels to contracts. They should not be assigning level three to contracts that don't have CUI, since that's the idea behind 800-171. Um, that that should be a level two or a level one. But I think DOD has been pretty clear that level two will see will be seen in very few contracts. It's a bulk of it will be level one, then level three. 
and the notice specifies that actually that they're not mm -hmm. anticipating any at level two and they do the some of the cost analysis um so this new rule has come out as an interim rule um saw it yesterday for the first time actually the day before there was a pre-announcement before the federal register publication um it's effective on november 30th what does this interim rule status means in, in terms of in terms of public comment period implementation etc right so this is come the end of november this is the rule that's going to come into effect um so of course the government will always take comments on proposed rules um but the timeline didn't allow that to happen so we're going to have this final interim rule that will take effect without comments being considered at the end of November, but there's still a comment period. And that comment period is open from now till actually the end of November. From that, DOD will collect the comments, evaluate them, and determine whether they wanna make uh, any alterations before they turn the interim final rule to final rule, probably sometime next year. So this is these are the clauses that we're gonna live with um, until that time without the benefit of comments. and. You know, I understand they had challenges uh, with COVID and everything else going on, but it's too bad that they didn't have an opportunity for comments prior to these rules, the institution of these rules, because I think public comments always make rules better because you have a lot of um, folks that have a lot of experience, contractors, um, just people in the, in the community who can make, make these rules better. Uh, I'm not saying that there's anything particularly wrong with these rules the way they're written, but um, you know, we're going to have to live with what's written right now without the benefit of the public input from on them. So the practical effect of that, uh, in terms of how these implement, because of the, the long-term rollout of, of um, CMMC over, over five years, that November 30th date, what's really, I think, from a practical perspective going to happen on that date is contractors will have to upload their basic assessment of NIST 171 compliance for their covered information systems to the DOD's uh, designated um, you know, repository. That sounds like that's an immediate requirement. They should have already complied. They should have already um, had a system security plan, a plan of action and milestones. So even if they don't comply with all 110 items, those items should be in the plan of action and milestones with a date that they will comply. And that's what's gonna be reported up. Does that sound right in terms of, of the immediate practical effect? Yeah, um, yes, I think this clause will have to be in the contract, though. It's not that uh, everyone will have to do it. It's that once this clause is inserted into a contract, then um, they'll have to do it. So but, new contracts, contract renewals, et yeah. cetera, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, so I, I'll just say this, Ed. I'll just add one more thing. Sorry. I wouldn't be surprised if, because of the importance of this, if contracting agencies are not, or DOD contracting agencies are not proactive in putting this clause in, um, kind of in between renewals and, and things like that, or at renewal. Um, okay. So wouldn't be surprised to see that. And then GSA may be adding it to their um, contracts as well. So let me dive into applicability a little bit. So the DOD has been saying all along that this program is designed to be everybody with an exception of commercial off-the-shelf COTS products. So in reading the new rule, it specifies that it says it's going to apply to all purchases that are above the micro purchases threshold. It says it includes purchases at or below the simplified acquisition threshold. So can you shed some light on those two thresholds? Um, what would be exempt that would fall under that micro purchase threshold? Yeah, so micro purchase is 10,000 and under. Um, so it really applies to contracts that are worth more than $10,000. Um, that in, in times of a national emergency where we're in now, there are instances where micro purchases as high as $25,000, by the way. But um, let's just assume it's $10,000 for now. And then it applies to commercial, but not to COTS. And the biggest difference between commercial and COTS, there are nuances, but the biggest difference is COTS products are sold in a substantial amount to the general public, essentially, um, whereas commercial doesn't have to be. So, um, you know, you have a vast majority, I'd say, of contracts that are going to include this. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, CMMC all has a COTS exclusion, but your, con your organization can only then sell COTS products to the federal government, right? If you have some contracts that are COTS, some that are commercial, um, you, the CMMC clause will still be applicable because you do have some commercial. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see the dichotomy or that play across all these different FAR clauses that we're, DFARS clauses that were being introduced to. 
Does that answer your question, Ed? Sorry. It does. It does. And I want to dig a little deeper into, into what's considered cost. I have an audience question that I think illustrates it, so I'll, I'll ask that version. Um, and the question is, we know that subcontractors need to be CMMC certified. What about vendors? For example, if I buy PCs from Dell for the office, does Dell need CMMC certification? Um, I wouldn't say that. Uh, so when this whole Huawei rule came out, I started talking about kind of the two supply chains. There's this, this supply chain things that you buy for your own internal use. And then there's a supply chain that you have that where you're going to buy something that's going to be repackaged or used somehow in a deliverable to the federal government or eventually, even if it's not immediately above. So when you're talking about um, those kinds of things and you look at your own internal supply chain, um, I don't know that, that, I mean, first of all, with respect to uh, CMMC, um, I, because that they're not technically a subcontractor to the federal government, they won't have to have a CMMC certification if you're buying computers for your own internal use. But then think about the other supply chain where you're uh, uh, you know, providing things to the federal government. They may have to have a CMMC certification if it's not COTS, right? So if you're buying PCs that they sell generally for the most part to the general public, um, you may not need a CMMC certification, but Dell may need one if they're creating these customized computers, for instance, for the federal government. So you have to kind of think of those two separate supply chains uh, when thinking about whether a CMMC certification is going to be required. So let me dive a little deeper into that subcontractor flow down and how that and how that works. Um, sure. So this is this is the flow down clause in these new clauses. Uh, 7020 and 7021 is very similar to the flow down language that's in the existing DFARS 7012. And it talks about subcontractor. So I, I also want to ask a little bit about the definition of subcontractor. So when I read uh, the DOD procurement toolbox FAQ, which by the way, for anybody in the audience that has not yet read the uh, DOD procurement toolbox FAQ on cybersecurity, it's, it's very enlightening. It's got a lot of good information in there. Um, but they give it, one of their questions, they give an example um, of a cloud service provider and whether the requirements of, of uh, DFAR 7012 would apply to that cloud service provider. And it says, yes, if they considered a subcontractor, but that is not typical, um, that a cloud service provider would be, w w would be considered a subcontractor. Um, so does that match your interpretation? I mean, you mentioned a minute ago that if you're buying these PCs, for example, for internal use, that's different than if they're gonna be part of some product that you deliver on behalf or to the government. Um, so I guess specific example, will we need to flow down these clauses to the company that's hosting our cloud email service that we're using for our company email? Right, um, I, think it I think kind of like to DOD's point, it depends on, on what you're using the cloud services for. Are you using a cloud service to um, you know, kind of upload all these government documents that contain CUI, then maybe so. Um, on the other hand, and, and the big cloud service providers are going to be compliant, right? It's their business to be compliant with these requirements. So I'd be surprised if we didn't see them all running out to get a CMMC certification so they can be subcontractors. But if you're just, you know, if you're using the cloud as a lot of companies do just to house a lot of their internal information, and things that are not government CUI or CDI, then I, I, I doubt that a cloud service provider is going to need to have this flow down. Because the, the example that's in that in that DOD procurement toolbox FAQ, and I'm sorry, I, I'm referencing something that we don't either haven't shared with you and don't have on the screen, but you know, it talks about giving CUI to the cloud service provider, and that even still, they would typically not be considered a subcontractor. And I guess it seems like the differentiation is whether their cloud service is part of something that you're delivering on behalf of the government or their cloud service is something that um, you're just consuming internally, say for, you know, back office kind of, kind of purposes. I mean, does that change the, yeah. the, the term subcontractor? Does that have a sort of a, a little meaning bit. like that? So when a company has a CMMC is going to have to be CMMC certified. Um, the, Assessor, I presume, is going to should be looking at the cloud service provider also as part of this the contractor system. So when you know a, when a contract when a when a, if a contractor is going for a level three and requires certain things, um, the calculus will be included in their cloud service providers their use of the cloud service providers cloud. Does the cloud service provider have the required uh, protections in place that are put into CMMC level three? 
So in that respect, you know, the, the, that cloud service provider is going to have to be compliant um, in order to get that CMMC certification, um, I would think. But, um, you know, whether they'd have to get a CMMC certification th themselves, it just is dependent on what, what that cloud service provider is being used for and how it's being used in the course of the government contract. Got it. Um, I've got a, a bunch of audience questions that are, are kind of related. I'm going to see if I can kind of sort these out. It says, if anything a prime um, asks a sub to comply with, um, such as a contract that contains CUI, wouldn't that be identified by stating that the contract contains CUI and labeling it as such? Um, so I guess the question is, if, if, the, if the CUI is not labeled when it comes from the government to the contractor or from the contractor to the subcontractor, um, how does that work? Is there a requirement, is it incumbent upon the government to label that data or the prime to label that data when they give it to the sub? Um, or is it enough that they simply put these clauses in, in the contracts and then the contractor will need to determine um, how and if they apply to their information systems? Um, yes, for the most part, but I, you know, if you look at the 7012 clause and I just pulled up on my computer because I wanted to be precise about it. If you look at covered defense information, it must be marked or otherwise identified in the contract, task order, et cetera, et cetera, and provided to the contractor by or on behalf of DOD. So that's what, that's that situation right there. Or collected, developed, received, transmitted, used, or stored by or on behalf of the contractor in support of the performance of the contract. So if you look at that second part of the definition, there's no labeling requirement. So if you, you know, if a contractor, I tell clients, if you're getting data that looks like it could be CUI, essentially, uh, covered defense information, um, then I would um, talk to the government about it and ensure that they don't think it's, it's covered defense information or CUI, because I feel, you know, this, this second part of the definition, collected, developed, received, um, by or on behalf of the contractor, and there's other terms in there too, in support of the performance of the contract, to me, that could potentially be read to say, if the government sends you that kind of information and it's not labeled, you may still have an obligation. Got it. Um, let me, just because we're kind of getting near the end of our time, and I have a lot of questions along those lines, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to another topic, sure. uh, and that's the one of cost. So um, one of the things that the interim rule contains is estimates of both the number of companies that these new rules will apply to, as well as some estimates of the cost of compliance on a per company basis. And they note in there um, that 74% of the entities that are affected are small businesses. So we know the cost of compliance is a big concern uh, for the small businesses in our audience. We've, we've discussed it on many of, many of these uh, sessions. Um, one thing to note is that as you read through the interim rule, the estimates that are in there do not include the cost of complying with the existing DFAR 7012. In other words, they've assumed that those costs have already been covered, even though the notice does mention that there's several studies that a lot of small businesses don't comply. And that's in fact, one of the big justifications for this interim rule is that people have not fully complied with the, with the current rule. Um, so, but rightly so, they've said that those costs would be covered under that, you know, the cost of the existing rule and they're only analyzing sort of the new cost. Um, what do you think about the cost estimates that are in this, this rule notice? Again, given it just came out a couple of days ago, brand new information. Yeah. I, I mean, I generally have a, trouble with how, um, and this is not just in this rule or DOD specific, but just, you know, the, the estimation of the cost on industry of particular rules. And it doesn't necessarily change what industry or the general public would think of a rule and how necessary it is. I think everyone agrees that something like this is necessary um, in some way, shape or form. Um, but like the example, the Huawei 889 rule had some pretty um, jarring numbers in it as far as the cost estimate, right? Before they changed the uh, certification to be a annual certification, it was originally a contract by contract certification. That was a $12 billion cost to industry over the course of the first year. And even though that was a large number, it was good to see that they were taking seriously the actual costs that industry would have for compliance with the rule. But I agree with you, Ed. I think a lot of the costs that are built in here are an assumption um, that contractors are already 800-171 compliant, but that doesn't take into account the fact that there are new contractors coming on board all the time who will have to ramp up to become 800-171 compliant 
or existing contractors who want to take a look at this every so often to make sure that they are continue, continue to be compliant. And there's a cost to that as well. So unless you've certified very recently by submitting a contract that you're compliant, um, most contractors are going to take the time to look to make sure they are compliant before filling out the form on the web. So I think it's a, a far greater cost than just filling out a web form. Understand where they're coming from, but I wish that they would have done kind of an analysis on uh, the overall cost um, that contractors more typically will have. I mean, I agree with you on the, the you know, that is a big missing cost of sort of, of maintenance, right? So, in they, in they do the cost analysis, they look at upfront one-time costs, they look at uh, sort of recurring costs of, of compliance, and the cost of assessments, and they amortize that. You know, assessments are done every, only every, every three years. But as you say, you have to maintain compliance. That's part of the DFARS requirement, is that you're compliant at the time of award, and you maintain that throughout award. So, um, you know, all the continuous monitoring functions and other things, um, I think, are, are not given as, at least, I'm not saying they ignored them. I'm saying that as I look at the estimate, I don't see those costs as explicitly mentioned as uh, some of the other other costs, like the upfront costs of, of bringing things into compliance or the cost of bringing in a C3PAO to do the assessment. You know, they've got those items called out, but the um, the ongoing ongoing maintenance, not so much. Um, right, and, and they don't control the CP3, C3PAO cost, right? Um, that's something that's supposed to be, I, I had heard, it's supposed to be kind of developed by the individual assessors and the assessor companies. Yeah. Um, so, I guess that's an estimate on how much time and the cost and what they're going to charge. But, you know, if your level three certification is going to cost $28,000 plus according to their own estimates. But like you said, it doesn't, it doesn't account for everything that has to happen before the assessment happens and, and maybe disputes that happen afterwards. Or after. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to uh, kind of wrap things up. We're here at the end of our time. I want to jump back to a comment you made about, you know, the big cloud providers um, probably going to, get CMMC probably going to bring their, or maybe already compliant um, audience, audience comment. It's not really a question, but a comment that says, you know, given that uh, DFAR 7012 requires that cloud service providers be FedRAMP moderate and agree to certain self-reporting of incidents, um, Microsoft as sort of the, the biggest offering out there, Microsoft 365, currently not compliant. So they have the FedRAMP piece covered. They don't have... Um, the self-reporting, and they say that they will not accept a, a flow down of these fire seventy twelve in their commercial environment, and they will not self-report um, incidents as required by that. Uh, so, in, in that sense, they've already kind of made a statement that it's, it's not compliant and won't be compliant. Um, and they're, you know, of, of folks that are doing our company emails, they're, I think, the largest market share right now. Um, so, so then the question is, do we have to go to other offerings from from them or other vendors that we could really get into truly compliance or is this not an issue? You know, are they not considered a subcontractor and therefore, um, you know, we don't need to flow this down to them, uh, DFAR 7012 for normal usage of email, you know, file sh sharing, that sort of thing. Yeah. I think for normal usage, you know, internal usage, you, you don't have to worry about it. It's there because they're not going to be considered a subcontractor. So I think you'll, you'd be, you know, folks would be okay then it's, you know, are you bringing that solution to a government agency, including and, and then requiring clauses to be flowed down to Microsoft and to use them as an example? Um, then that's a different situation. Um, and um, so it'll be interesting to see how the, that all shakes out. But you know, I think um, I think uh, for for most contractors, it's not going to be an issue. That's a really important distinction, and I think one that I hope we get some more clarity on. Uh, from the DOD because it is just a question that comes up uh, all the time, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. Because Microsoft has made some very public statements about what they will and won't do in terms of flow downs. And I'm, I'm picking on them just again, they have the, they have the largest market share, uh, but they've made some very public statements. And I think it's created some confusion amongst their consumers about you know, what's appropriate uh, to meet these new clauses in terms of using their, their services. And, and okay, I'm picking on them, but there's others in the same boat as well. Yeah. Um, so I just have one kind of closing, closing question, uh, kind of putting you on the spot here. So given none of us have looked at this for more than 48 hours, um, you've probably looked at it more than, more than most people, given your, your profession. Um, public comment period is open now. As of yesterday, we have, um, you know, I think 60 day, 60 day, 90 day public comment period, 60, 60, 60 day. What is your, 
so far, this far in, what is your number one public comment on this new rule? I, I, I think for the CMMC side, um, since um, I think the, the biggest thing is they just need to clarify the role that subcontractors are going to play in this. A prime, a prime contractor is going to role play vis-a-vis -vis their subcontractors. Contractors. Let me see if I can talk again. So um, kind of more clarification on what the prime needs to do vis-a-vis -vis their sub and how that level is going to be assigned and what DOD's role is going to be and all that and how, you know, how they'll check up on primes because I think that's going to be an issue, a big issue moving forward on CMMC because you'll see, um, you know, some subs that are able to get level three, some that are able to get level one and, and perhaps um, an insistence by a prime contractor that they need to, a sub needs to have level three even if they really don't. You know, there's a lot of machinations, I think, there that I think could use some clarity. Well, Eric, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, we are a little bit over our time. Um, I have a lot of questions from the audience that we did not get to. I worked in a few, but there's, there's many, many more. Uh, so perhaps we'll need uh, one or, or more sessions to unpack this as this unfolds and we all learn a little bit more about, about uh, what it means. Um, so I, I want to I want to thank you for your for your time today, sure. um, audience. I want I want to thank you, and I want to apologize for not getting to all of your questions. Um, so please join us again for some future town hall meetings. Our next session is going to be Wednesday, October seventh, at one p.m. Eastern. So keep an eye out for the uh, the login information there. Um, I also want to mention two upcoming events that we have uh, coming up in October. Uh, one is a cybersecurity summit. Uh, in, in concert with federal publication seminars it's an all day all day event uh, with some excellent uh, panelists and speakers talking about cybersecurity CMMC uh, certainly all these these new rules are, are at the forefront of that discussion and then um, October 26th through 28th we have an event uh, so all one day one and a half days plus an evening so over spent over three days October 26th to 28th uniting women in cyber um, again many many good speakers and some excellent content there uh, please head to our website neosystemscorp.com for details on the cybersecurity summit and uniting women in cyber event thank you very much for your time and we'll see you next time